This season of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is proudly supported by My Music Staff. Because my earliest background with, was with chords, I, it doesn't matter what kind of music I'm playing, I'm thinking chords. Mm. And I have to be careful, as you said, you know, you would rather work off a lead sheet. I have to be really careful now that what I'm, if I'm playing something classical, that I'm playing what's on the page and not just some arrangement. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Season 4, 2018 of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. My name is Tim Topham, your host for the show. And if this is your first time here, a very special welcome and thank you for tuning in. Even if you're a long-time listener, it's a pleasure to have you here and I do appreciate your, your ears. You're listening to episode number 144 of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast and I did want to give a special welcome to my Inner Circle members. The Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is your home for inspiration, ideas, business and teaching strategies to help support your teaching and grow your studio. In today's episode, I've invited one of my Inner Circle members to talk about her experience using one of the most popular free downloads I offer on my website. That's my top 10 pop songs for piano students. We'll explore how she's using it in her teaching and the success she's had with it and also some of my other resources with students of all ages. We'll unpack what she was doing before and the effect that encouraging this type of pop playing has had on her students. Today's show notes and a full transcript are now available at timtopham.com slash episode 144. Those of you following me for a while will know that I built much of my blog and speaking on the topic of pop music. In fact, I kind of became known as the pop teaching guy when I started speaking back in about 2011 or 12. Um, hopefully, I'm now known as more than that um, and... Uh, over the time though, I think that's changed as I've spoken on different topics, but there is still that element of Tim Topham being the guy that knows pop music teaching. Uh, and I guess one of the reasons that's happened is yes, I have spoken on the topic a number of times, but I also am very passionate about the power of pop music teaching and being both open to helping students learn what they want to learn, but also seeing the value in teaching students via a chordal method because it unpacks so much of the depth of the, um, the understanding and the background of music that can be a huge help for students in all their songs and pieces of their learning. However, one of the challenges for teachers is knowing what pop song to teach. So I created a summary of my top 10 pop songs and packaged it up into a free download, which I know that many of you are using in your studios already. Of course, there are, there are two big challenges with pop, and I bet if I asked you what are your two big challenges, you could put your hand up and tell me. Um, one of them tends to be around keeping current and working out what songs to teach. And the second one is how to teach music that's actually too hard for the student. So let me discuss these both in turn. This idea of keeping current. Well, I actually don't believe that we all need to keep current and keep up with all the trends of pop music because one, it changes too quickly. Two, children all have different views, even adults, of, of what they actually want to learn. So it doesn't actually matter if it's in the top 10. It might not be what students are actually interested in. And of course, it might not even be something that's very playable. So don't worry about keeping current. Let yourself off the hook right now. I give you full permission. Instead, get used to asking students what they want to learn. So don't try and guess. It, it, this also, of course, increases engagement and allows students to uh, have a, a say and um, autonomy and power, I guess, in what's going on in their music lessons, which can have a great uh, boost can give a great boost to rapport and the relationship that you have with your student. The challenge, of course, with asking students what they want to learn in their lesson, what songs they're listening to, is that it's hard to prepare what you're actually going to teach unless you find out beforehand. So as you may have heard, if you've heard me speak or seen some of my videos, my suggestion to you, if you're open to teaching some pop music for a student, is the lesson before you actually plan to do something, ask them to give you a list of what songs they'd like to learn. And in actual fact, I just got one of these back from the parents of one of my students today. And uh, let me tell you what she said. 
Um, Tim, you asked for song suggestions for William. He's interested in learning The Smell of Rebellion, Revolting Children and School Song, all from Matilda the Musical, Believer by Imagine Dragons, The Greatest Show and The Other Side from The Greatest Showman and maybe a few Christmas carols. So you can see that there's a huge variety of options and things that children want to learn. Will is, uh, he's in grade six, so he's about 11 or 12. um, And that's his... Uh, list of songs that he wants to learn. So isn't that interesting? It, it, it's a lot of musical theatre. Um, but for other students, it may be 80s music. It may be even Beatles. Uh, others will be really modern. It might be rap and hip-hop and things like that. So be open to whatever your student wants to learn. But ask them that in the week before you actually plan to start doing it. I think that's my biggest tip for you. Now, music that's too hard. That was a second issue that uh, comes up a lot. So my first tip for this is to firstly ask the student what part of the song they'd actually like to learn. For some students, it's just the opening four bars, some cool piano riff. For some other students, it might be just the horns that they can hear in the chorus. You really don't know until you ask. And it's quite rare in my experience that students want to learn the whole of a song. Quite oftentimes, they just want to learn bits and pieces. And that's totally okay too. Uh, But I know that for students coming from a more, sorry, teachers coming from a more traditional background, the idea of half learning a song or just learning a bit of it might be a little bit hard to understand. But what I would say is that students can gain a whole lot of skills from just a small amount of pop music or any song really. They, it can build great strength in the relationship between you and the teacher, uh, you and your student. And of course, it does give them that sense of autonomy, which is really powerful these days, particularly with your teenage students. So ask them what part they would like to learn. That's my first tip. The second one is use pop music as an opportunity to teach harmony and chords. It's literally the best way to learn the theory of music through practical application. And I've talked about this on many podcasts, webinars, speaking at conferences, Pop music is one of the best ways to help students understand things like cadences, chord progressions, uh, harmony, and why music sounds good, how it's put together. The root of just about all music, apart from atonal music, tends to be harmony and chords. So if we can teach them about that through a medium that they're used to and understand innately because they listen to it, pop music, then it's a great approach to take. So for that reason, I don't encourage teachers to rearrange music for their students because the real learning is in simplifying back to the chords and I like to show the students how I'm actually doing that myself. So a better approach in my opinion, rather than find out what the song is, go and do a complete arrangement and then come back with a score, printed score that they can learn, instead of that, and by the way, I don't have I don't know many teachers that actually have time to do that and probably don't even if they quite enjoy doing it, they probably don't have time to do it. But I think many probably don't really enjoy doing that either. So take that pressure off. I'm permitting you to not rearrange music for students because again, that real learning is in learning how to simplify themselves. So what I recommend you do is simplify the song with them a little bit at a time in your lessons and teach them what you're doing. Tell them to listen to bass lines, to work out the key, to understand that there's a certain set of chords that tend to work in each key. And if you're interested in more depth about how I teach this approach, particularly relating to the circle of fifths, then I have a full course on this in my Inner Circle membership. It's called Piano Flicks, Teaching Pop Piano. It's an eight-part video series all about teaching pop, pulling it apart, working with students on it, helping them rearrange it, using technology to do it. And that also links beautifully into my four-chord composing course, which you can find out more about at timtopham.com slash chords. I would also encourage you to encourage your students to sing and not play the melody. The hardest thing about pop music and the reason why the rhythms are so complex is generally because we're asking students to try and play the melody. And melodies are never made to be played. They can be, but it's clunky and it's really difficult. So if you can possibly encourage your students to sing and just play what the pianist in a band would play, which of course is what? Yes, it's chords, then you're going to have far more success with 
pop songs. Now, I know that some students won't be too excited about singing and that's okay. So an app like Notestar, N-O-T-E-S-T-A-R by Yamaha is a great one because it actually not only includes the band backing tracks and the sheet music, which you can read the chords from, it also includes the singer singing the melody. Uh, So I think that's a great approach too. And if you do feel the need to use music like you might find on an app like Notestar or if you download from Music Notes, then use them as lead sheets rather than trying to play the full arrangements. And what I mean by that is, yes, use the printed music for your reference, but teach the students about the chord symbols that are above the music. And again, if you need help with that, and then definitely check out the Piano Flicks course or even our Take the Lead course all about lead sheets with Forrest Kinney, both of which are in our Inner Circle members area. I also have a free webinar on pop music teaching and lead sheets, which you can access at timtopham.com slash events. So what's all this got to do with the top 10 pop songs download? Well, when you first use a chord-based approach in your lessons, it's good to introduce students to songs that use some of these simple chord progressions, but they're also real, in inverted commas, songs. There are some great ones out there which work really well for this purpose, which are the ones I've chosen. And because, again, some songs don't work very well on piano. And believe me, I've tried just about everything. I've tried r and I've tried Eminem, rap, um, metal, and some of that stuff didn't go so well. I tried and the students will appreciate you trying. But oftentimes it's good to go, you know what, that song, it's a great song, but here's one that's actually really good and fun to play on piano. So if they don't know it, let's have a listen to it on YouTube first and Nine times out of 10, I've found that even for songs like The Beatles, most students tend to be able to recognize it, even if they're quite young. So what does the download actually look like if you haven't seen it before? Well, we've got one song to a page, and on that page, you get the sheet music of the opening, plus you get a lead sheet with the chords and also a lyric sheet. And a lyric sheet is where you've just got the lyrics of the song written out with a chord symbol above it, so no music at all. And then you've also got the lead sheet, which tends to include a little bit of melody with the chord above. And then I've also given you full sheet music just for the first four bars or so. Now, on each page, you also get some teaching notes, why I teach that particular song and how, and any important notes to consider about it. Things like maybe the key or being able to play it along to the YouTube, things like that. Now, I also want you to note that this download is now in its fourth edition. So if you previously downloaded an early version, then if you didn't get an email from me with the updated one, you can head to timtopham.com slash pop and follow the link uh, in the show notes as well for that updated version. It's the fourth edition uh, now with the full scores and all the information updated. And as I said before, I personally have this download on hand pretty much all the time as I'm teaching because sometimes it's a planned part of my curriculum. So I will be teaching a particular chord set and hey, Let It Be is a great song to use when they know the primary triads in the key of uh, C, for example. Other times I'll use it as something to fill in time when a student perhaps hasn't practiced or I sense it's a good idea to change things up. And having a download like this on hand is a brilliant go-to for all your lessons. And as you know, I like mixing things up between asking what song they'd like to learn and occasionally giving them a song I know will work really well. And that's these top 10 pop songs. So why don't we hear now from a teacher who's actually been using this in her studio? I'm very excited to welcome today's guest, Anna Fagan, one of my Inner Circle members, Florida teacher and longtime top 10 pop song users. Here she is. My guest today has a Bachelor of Arts degree in piano performance and enjoys teaching from her home studio in Clermont, Florida. A church musician and collaborative pianist, she is a frequent presenter on music technology at state and local music teacher meetings. She's actually just come from her local chapter conference. Welcome to the show, Anna Fagan. Oh, thank you, Tim. Happy to be here. Thank you very much. It's lovely to chat with you. And uh, I thought before we get into finding out a little bit more about how you've used uh, this download, could we just get a quick overview of your own studio, your numbers and whether you teach groups or individual, that sort of thing? Yeah, sure. Um, I teach from my home in Claremont. I've got about 35 students and I teach weekly private lessons during the school year. Um, I do group lessons about five times a year, usually preparing for some kind of event. And then in the summer, I have a little more relaxed schedule and I offer some more groups then. 
with um, working with Clavinova keyboards and doing um, lead sheet and um, chord chart workshops, that kind of thing. Fantastic. Yeah. Very mixed, uh, mixed teaching, uh, studio. And, uh, I know we'll, we'll get into the, um, the guts of talking about some of the pop teaching you've been doing. Um, but look, you were one of actually one of my foundation inner circle members joining in March, 2016. I went, went back and had a look at the records. A quick <laughs> question. Why, what made you decide to join back then? Well, in 2015, I went to NCKP for the first time. Um, and that was, I think the first time I'd ever been at a conference where I really felt like the creative part of teaching was at least as important as what everyone else was doing, all the classical. I really felt like it was respected for probably the first time in my life. Mm. And, and that gave you a kind of a new appreciation. Were you, were you already doing some creative things or were you like, aha, I, this is what I want to do more of? Well, I started off creative. I, I felt like, I feel like now I've come full circle because when I started um, at, at like age seven, it was playing the organ and I didn't learn bass clef. I learned chords and the guy that I was studying with taught me how to arrange and how to put medleys together. And we worked on a lot of ear stuff. And then when he retired, that's when my classical training began. Um, but I always felt from then on that that was like, second class that was like something you could do as an aside or with a few students but it, it, it that's not what i should be i felt like that's not what i should be focusing on you're talking and about the classical you did, piano, right? that i should be focusing on classical and that all right. the rest of that all the rest of that stuff was kind of fluff yes you know, okay. it, you know it was like second class and then um you were at nckp and you did um one of the talks that you did was on your pop uh, music course, right. which I then bought. And then when you started Inner Circle, I thought, well, if it's going to be more of this kind of stuff, then, then I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we are delighted to have had you uh, involved in the community and sharing so freely of your own experiences and, and resources and things. And that's why I thought you'd be great to talk about this particular uh, resource, which you've shown um, us how you've been using, which is the top 10 pop song worksheet. Yeah. What, what fun. Yeah. 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 So how much pop teaching specifically were you doing bef with your students before you came across this download and some of my other things? Um, I mostly would do just when they would ask, you know, if, if they would come in and they um, had been listening to something on the radio and they wanted to know, could I play this on the piano? Do you know this song? Then I would do it, but it was always like the extra, like I said, the fluff. Right. Okay. And so what, what's the, been the biggest change in the last two years then? So since 2015 for you in regard to this approach? Well, it, it's been a relief to me because in Florida anyway, the kids are tested to death in school. And so I have dropped off on a lot of my um, assessment programs. I used to be really active in um, Piano Guild. Um, and what I found that the kids don't want most of them testing on piano anymore and they don't come in and they haven't practiced because they're so overloaded with school and other activities and so to be able to do things with chords um take some of that pressure off you know if they're not having to read if they can use other skills um, that don't have to be uh, reinforced for an hour a day at home then it's easier for me it's more fun for me and i'm finding it's a lot more fun for them it's interesting because when I go to read music, uh, so my dad's 80th is coming up and we've decided, uh, don't tell anyone, we're going to do a sing along because he's got lots <laughs> of musical friends and it's going to be a bit of a surprise. I'm going to choose some great a couple of Beatles numbers on musical theater or whatever it is. And well, I've been playing through the music and, you know, I, I instantly gravitate towards lead sheet playing I, I will go out of my way to find a lead sheet if i can before i try and find a full score and even if i do find the full score i'll just be following the chord symbols and the melody anyway uh yes. so to me it's it's um it's giving students that skill to understand that there is another way to read music and actually it's it's a bit more it adds a bit more freedom but it's actually a fair bit easier too when you understand well, it well, it is. And, and, you know, you asked how I used to do pop. I used to feel kind of honor bound as a classically trained teacher to make them count all of those rhythms. We would mm -hmm. pencil in the rhythms and they had to tap and count them just like they would, you know, Beethoven. Um, and now, 
especially when we're not doing lead sheets or even if you get a simplified lead sheet, um, they're working with recordings and I want them tapping like you'd be in a, in a karaoke bar. Mm -hmm. I want them to be able to tap like maybe on a single note on the piano, what the singer would do. And if they hear it differently than whoever wrote it out, then that's fine. Uh, and it, it is, it's so freeing and they have such fun. Yeah. It's they, that whole, the whole thing about rhythm and pop music it is the hardest thing. So being flexible in your yeah. approach to that, <laughs> that would have been, that would have been alone a big change and a big relief. I imagine as a teacher. It's yes. Like, I don't for have for me and for the student. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So tell us how you've been using the top 10 pop songs download in your studio and with what ages and, and what do you do with it? Uh, well, last year, um, last school year, my focus was on chords and composition. And so the top 10 was something I integrated in the spring as kind of the tail end of them learning all of their major and minor chords. And then some of my older kids um, were doing all the different, you know, seventh chords and such. And so this was kind of their payoff for all their hard work with the chords is they get to see that, well, guess what? That's what all these people use in their songs. So I've had students as young as um, seven. And I've had, I just had a student this evening that's probably in her fifties. And, um, and we were working on um, Lean On Me because her brother's a guitarist and sings and he has a band, I guess they do gigs. And so um, she's gonna see him in a month. And so she, he has said that she could sit in and play the piano. So tonight she had done the right hand chords and I have him do the chords in first inversion on that uh, mm -hmm. piece. And we changed it around. And then tonight I taught her um, a little bit fancier left hand. So it's like what a bass guitarist would do mm -hmm. uh, for the left hand. Uh, and so it's just so much fun. Mm. Yeah, so I've used it with all age students. It's great. Um, I'll tell you, the hallelujah has been a real blessing because I've had so many kids that want that. And it's in 6-8. Yeah, it's, it's good to break it up a bit, isn't it? Eight, oh, if they don't know 6-8, but to just put the chords and say, okay, count to six, and then it's, it sounds perfect. Now, a quick word from our sponsor, My Music Staff. Most of you have already heard about My Music Staff and how their software helps thousands of music teachers manage their businesses more efficiently. They handle all of your student management issues, scheduling, billing, and so much more. It's what I personally use in my own studio and it's no surprise why it's the leading studio management software. What I think really makes My Music Staff stand out is its community-driven development and personal approach to customer support. It was such a pleasant surprise jumping into My Music Staff for the first time and realizing how in tune it was with my business and the ins and outs of a music studio. Since they partner with the music community to develop their software, they've been able to anticipate what teachers need and are constantly improving their software to exceed expectations. And a more recent example of responding to community feedback was the addition of a very popular feature, streaming video and audio files directly within the My Music Staff app. And that means that no longer do you have to download files to your device. So it makes it incredibly easy to share content with your students. My Music Staff is super easy to get up and running. The transition away from paper and spreadsheets is painless. If you do need help, the quality of support is second to none and you'll always get a fully personalized response. I have yet to see the level of attention and care I receive from my music staff provided by any other software platforms I use. And I use a lot of software in my business. So what have you got to lose? Just go to mymusicstaff.com and sign up for their free 30-day trial today. And look, all of this um, came about me getting you on the podcast because you posted a basically the cutest video I've ever seen of <laughs> your young student, Leo. Tell us about Leo and what he was yeah. doing. Uh, well, it's Luca. He'll have me get oh, his sorry, name right. Luca, That's sorry. okay. <laughs> um, Luca, well, first of all, I should say that uh, Luca has perfect pitch. Um, I, I, I'm finding more students these days that have perfect pitch. I don't know if, if I just am attracted to them or maybe there's something in the water. Um, but I had a choir director a few years ago at church that had perfect pitch. And I remember asking him, how can I help? a kid really develop if he already has perfect pitch. And he said, work on harmony with him. So the top 10 with the chords was really perfect for him because I have him listening, not just for the melody, but for the harmony and, and you know, what inversion of this chord do you hear on the recording? 
And then he's very heavily into always, he's in a private school and they have talent shows. And so he's been doing um, <laughs> Let It Be. And he's singing, as you saw in the recording, he sings and plays all of it. And we've done fancier left hand stuff. And, and yeah, so it's, it's been great fun with working with him. <laughs> well, your, uh, Luca's mom has given you permission for us to play it. So I'm going to play it now. Uh, oh, good. <laughs> uh, so everyone can hear it because it is just adorable. Melted my heart. You know, wasn't that just gorgeous? And clearly having so much fun and j just there's a sense of freedom about how he plays as well. Like with no, no music and just this, just this awesome sense of I'm, I'm having a great time. And he's just seven. Can you imagine what he's going to be doing at 14? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's pretty amazing. He's been in some uh, theater, done some theater work, you know, with his singing. Um, but it is so freeing, you know, for them just to be able to not have to be tied. The kids that don't like to read, they, they don't want to read. And so I always tell them that you only have to read the first time. And then it's up to you whether you find some Tim way, some Luca way, some Anna way to figure out how are you going to remember this. And, and because my earliest background with, was with chords, I, it doesn't matter what kind of music I'm playing, I'm thinking chords. Mm. And I have to be careful, as you said, you know, you would rather work off a lead sheet. I have to be really careful now that what I'm, if I'm playing something classical, that I'm playing what's on the page and not just some yes. arrangement. I'm the same. <laughs> I have to I try think and... maybe it should be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have to force myself to really play all the notes now when I'm, yeah, I've got to concentrate on that. <laughs> yes. Uh, so um, I was just going to think with Luca, did he know that song already? I, I'm not sure. His dad listens to all kinds of music. Um, he came into one of his first lessons playing um, O Fortuna from the Carmina Burana. <laughs> okay. And he was, he was just picking out the melody. And I said, Luca, is that from Carmina? And his mom didn't have any idea. And so I, I pulled the, you know, the first page off music notes and, oh, yeah, that's it. So we did the first page of... Oh, Fortuna, why not? So, why not? Bum, bum, <laughs> so bum, he does bum, just all kinds. Of, bum, yeah, bum, his dad bum, listens bum. to all kinds of music. So he, he probably has heard some Beatles before. I don't remember. Yeah, interesting. But I, I, I'm always surprised too with that top 10 pop song, the, the download, that the number of kids that do know the old songs. I mean, the Beatles is mm -hmm. 50 years old or something now. And it's remarkable how many kids Leo's age or early teens will know of them mm -hmm. and Hallelujah and things like that. And oftentimes oh, yeah. it's because they're used in movies. Uh, everyone knows Hallelujah from Shrek. Uh, yeah. And, and some, sometimes my students teach me, oh, yeah, I heard that on that video game or whatever it was. It's always fun. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Billy Joel's making a big comeback and Elton John, a, mm. a lot of the kids. Um, I had this, um, this fall, I asked them all what their favorite tune was and I had one um, girl say Vincent. And right. I said, like Don McLean's Vincent. Oh yes. Isn't that the most beautiful song? And I said, well, yes it is. But how do you know? <laughs> really? <laughs> so she's, um, that's her ear training assignment is she's picking out some of a uh, starry, starry night. Yeah. Right. There you go. So what's been the biggest benefit for you of using this particular download in your studio? And this might be teaching related. It might actually be business or marketing, that sort of thing. Um, I don't know that it's been a, a marketing thing. I mean, I've been kind of a um, outside the box person for a while. So, and that's nice because I, I like working with that kind of a student. Um, I think the biggest payoff for me has been that kids now see a reason to do a real reason to do the scales and the chords. You know, it's not just for an exam. It's not just because this is something that you should do. I mean, I would tell them before you're going to find this. And we would in classical pieces, you know, the older kids, I would say, write in what the chord symbols are and, and they understood it. But now even my little kids understand, Oh, these are, this is what songs are made out of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, isn't that, isn't that great when they can actually go through an 
any, any piece of music that they're learning that's not pop and actually recognize that, oh, this is, yeah, there's a simple progression going on here and actually I can put these yeah. labels in. Uh, I love doing that with my students as well. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, it's eye-opening for them in many ways. Yeah, so, it's a payoff. <laughs> yeah, totally. So what advice would you give to other teachers who might be where you were a while ago thinking, well, you might be able to play this way yourself with the chords and the lead sheets, you, you know, the classicals, the, the important stuff and the pops a bit of fluff. What would you say to them uh, who are feeling a bit unsure at the moment? Um, I would say take advantage of those weeks when your kid comes in and they didn't bring their music with them. Or when they come in and, and you have that, that honest you know, relationship where they can say, I didn't practice. And you can say, thank you for telling me. Thank you for being honest. And just pull this out because it gives them a really quick win. And if you haven't done it before, the kids will love that, that you're learning it with them. You know, kids love it when we make mistakes. <laughs> you know, I, I will make mistakes and I'll say, did you know I, make a I made a mistake? And sometimes they won't even know. And I'll say, well, that's even better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but they would, they would love to learn with you, you know, and, and there's so much on YouTube these days that you can, uh, if you want to preview some lessons before you actually sit down with a kid, you know, you can do that. But they would love just learning it with you. Mm. Oh, that's great. I think that's a, that's a really great way to wrap up our little chat today. Was there anything else that you wanted to add for, for teachers who were listening before we uh, close up our conversation? Um, I don't think so. I just, I, I have, I've talked with many um, other teachers in the last few years and said that I think um, we've got to start changing our expectations if we want to be happy as teachers um, because piano lessons for most kids don't mean what they used to mean. Um, they don't mean the same thing to parents that they used to mean even when we were growing up. And so I think it's okay for us to, to redefine what that is, what, the, what place the lessons have in their uh, daily life and how we can still be happy and feel productive as teachers. And would you say practice, the issue around practice is a part of that? It is. You know, I just, uh, when I was waiting to talk with you tonight, I was reading through an email of my, uh, the mom from my youngest student. Um, he's six. And um, they're back and forth of whether he's going to continue lessons. And she said, um, you know, I was outside this weekend and I heard him inside playing Mary Had a Little Lamb. And, and I said, that's great, you know, but at six, he wants you sitting on the bench next to him. Um, kids want an activity that their parents will do with them. You don't have to know what you're doing. You don't have to be a superstar. But I think um, this is what piano needs to be these days. It needs to be an activity that parents are doing with their young children, sitting on the bench next to them. There's plenty of, uh, you know, they could play the bass line while their kids play in the chords in, in your top 10 pop. That mm. could be a win. Um, I'm, I encourage kids all the time to teach their parents some of their songs. Great tip. I love it. Well, look, Anna, thank you very much. We could talk for a lot longer, but I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much sure. for joining me and sharing those uh, tips with us today. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. So I really hope you enjoyed that chat with Anna and got a good perspective about how this single download can impact your teaching and your students. One of the comments I get a lot about my courses and downloads is about their relaxed approach. I'm really keen to support and strengthen your teaching through great resources and training. And as I'm a teacher too, I want to show you these in action, which is why I record and share my teaching so much. And I love being at the piano while I demonstrate things. Here's what Rachel recently said about how my courses feel. She said, I really like how you do the courses very relaxed and user-friendly and not perfect. I love it that you come across like a real live teacher just like us and I really like how you are trying to help everyone teach better. And that's a great summary of the approach that I use. It's not perfect. I don't tend to edit very much. I just sit down at the piano and show you how to teach and what I do. I also wanted to share this comment from one of our Inner Circle forums from uh, one of my members, Guy, who's in Adelaide, South Australia. And it outlines exactly the way in which I love this download being used, having it on hand for moments just like this. So Guy says, within just a few short weeks of Inner Circle membership and two weeks into the new school year, I have already found Tim Topham's resources giving me helpful ideas, sparking new ones and providing ideas that were wonderfully laid out for me at just the right time. 
In one of my piano lessons last week, I had Tim's Top 10 Pop Songs PDF printed out and on hand when I allowed one of my teenage students to play whatever he wanted on the piano for a little while. He's very much a self-learner via YouTube and such. Whilst I was literally perusing the pop songs in the document, my student began playing a fast jazz-based intro to a song which happened to be Billy Joel's Piano Man. Well, with only a few moments of discovering which song he was playing, I placed in front of him the chord chart and lead sheet from Tim's Top 10 Pop Songs collection. I was then able to guide my student according to his interest, but with some structure for the rest of the lesson. It was an absolute golden moment and I'm looking forward to many more of them. Thanks, Tim and the team. And if you sometimes struggle with knowing what to give teens in particular, then check out this quick story from Christine. She says, Thanks so much for the download, specifically my top 10 pop songs for beginner piano students. Two of my piano students who happen to be siblings are in that preteen teenage. I never know quite what songs to give them. They don't always know what they want to play. And this article was very, very helpful. I have some great ideas. So I wanted to finish today's podcast with a story from a final member about the impact of using Let It Be from the top 10 pop songs with an adult student this time. And this is from Ellen and she says, Dear colleagues, last week an adult student contacted me to restart lessons after a year off and I decided I would take a different approach this time with her. I needed to sit down and reflect about what her agenda at the piano was. I know she took lessons as a child and her reading skills were awkward and inefficient. She also loves to figure out popular pieces at the piano. She's a joyful person and loves to diddle around at the keyboard. Bastian's adult piano lessons was just not going to keep her or me awake throughout the lessons and I'm honestly quite tired of teaching pieces that just don't jive with my students' passions. No more on top of old Smokey for my adult students. At the first lesson, I decided to introduce Let It Be from one of the top 10 pop song pieces. I used Note Star and we worked out the chord progression using root chords in the right hand and bass line in the left hand. I recorded a short video reminder on different ways she could groove up the accompaniment. I first showed her the progression in its purest form and then worked up a fun left-hand rhythm. Then I used Tim's idea of visually figuring out the chords. That worked for her and off she went with these tools. She's still figuring out the major chords, but that's okay. She has time to work up that ability to feel the chords in her hands before jumping to the next chord in a progression. Memorial Day weekend was upon us, so I sent her home with these two new skill builders, Let It Be and random chord exercises with root major chords only, and two old reading pieces to bring her fingers back. Three days later, she was back with the Let It Be chord progression worked out and with a fun left-hand beat she'd figured out. I suggested a few other ideas, which she loved, and then we played along with Note Star and she was thrilled. She seemed a bit unsure about the major minor chord differences, so we got into chord groups. White, white, white is group one, white, black, white is group two, etc., And I had her arpeggiate the chord groups in a circle of fifths feeling, and then I had her create a chord progression using the chords within a chord group. She loved this and added her little groove she had figured out. I suggested she continue to work on the different chord progressions and write down the ones she liked the most. This would definitely help her comfort level of finding root position chords quickly. I'm limiting her to root position chords, although I mentioned how we will expand this. Hinting sweets in the future is always a good idea with adults. Then we applied all this chord development to Elton John's piece, Tiny Dancer, which she excitedly texted me the night before as the next piece she wanted to learn. This piece is everywhere on the internet in many arrangements at Notestar, Muse.com, Music Notes and the rest. I decided we would first approach it quarterly, so we went again on Notestar and created a grid following the chord progression. Slash chords are a big part of the piece, so I now introduced slash chords. What fun! We played with the chord progression and used the form we created with Let It Be, where she kept the root chords in the right hand and bass line in the left. I showed her various arrangements and I found at different sites, and I suggested at the next lesson we will add the opening arpeggiated arrangement, just like Elton's, using inversions, and maybe in a few weeks even add the melody. For now though, I suggested we stay away from the sheet music arrangements and continue to focus on the chord progression technique and figuring out the form of the piece by ear. We got through the first verse and it was quite enjoyable and obtainable. I suggested she play the progression and follow the official video on YouTube so that she can hear and sing along with Elton's golden voice as he plays. She danced out the door. Can't wait for the next lesson. What a turnaround for me. I used to dread her lessons and her awkward attempts to play awkward arrangements of pieces. Now she's going to go home and diddle all day at her lovely piano.
Isn't that just the most beautiful story? And it just sums up the impact that this style of teaching can have on students, both young and old. Thank you so much, Ellen, for sharing that story with us. And a few times Ellen mentioned NoteStar and NoteStar is one of the apps that I do recommend you consider using if you're going to be teaching pop songs. The great advantage of NoteStar is that for a student, as I mentioned earlier, who doesn't want to sing, they can play along with the singer as well as the rest of the band. So a great one to check out and we'll put a link to it in the show notes. So would you like to know what my top 10 list includes after all that? Well, if you are, then head to timtopham.com slash pop. You can read about the background of this approach and download your own copy today. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed this look into the impact that adding a little bit of pop can have in your studio. Next week on the podcast, we're actually dealing with a little bit of a difficult subject and it's all about dealing with loss in the studio. It's going to be a bit of a tough episode, but I feel that it's an important topic to cover. And I've invited a special guest on to discuss this with me and share some of her own insights and personal experience into this difficult topic. Until then, I can't wait to speak with you. I'm Tim Topham, and this is the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.